Hello and welcome to Securities Lending Saturday. This is the place to learn about the fundamentals of securities lending. I'm Roy Zimmerhansel and today I'm going to be talking about the types of problems that can come up, what you can do about them and how to avoid it. All right. So that's the topic for today. It's another Saturday, it's raining again, so I'm happy to be inside again and always happy to be with you if you are joining me today. That's great. Just a quickie, this is the YouTube channel where you can find the uh, full fundamentals series. And later today, as I said, you'll find this video alongside it. Feel free to look at that. We have a whole range of uh, topics. We've just posted up, in fact, quite a watched uh, video cast of an interview with the people at Blue Fire Artificial Intelligence, where we talk about how they've applied artificial intelligence to identify potential short candidates and to help people manage risk portfolios. So that's a, a super interesting one. And uh, I invite you to take a look at that. That's on the channel as well. In the meantime, uh, as always, I'm interested in finding out where you're joining me from. And I appreciate you just popping into the chat that you are here and where you are watching. In the meantime, I'm just going to get my handy dandy slide deck up and get that ready to present to you. Remember, if you are interested in watching the or receiving a copy of the slides that I use today and from previous weeks, you can always do that by signing up to receive the slides. I'll put a quick thing up there. This is where you can download to receive the slides. For anyone that's on the list, uh, if you haven't received last week's um, slides yet, you'll be getting them later today as well. So I'm now just going to quickly share my screen and you'll be able to see today's topic. So there you go. Fundamentals of securities lending at times of crisis. So this is another multi-part series because the truth is it's impossible to cover everything all in one go. And in fact, even in the subset, the way that I've parsed it out for this week and the following two weeks, I think that there's quite a lot of depth here that you need to go into either one-on-one, -on -one, always happy to talk to people about it, or of course we have our course. So let's just get started very quickly. Let's get started. As I said, these are the previous uh, weeks. This is a uh, transaction focused crisis issues. This is week 12. I can't believe I've been doing this for 12 consecutive Saturdays. Look, I'm loving it. And I've been getting quite a lot of feedback, particularly this week from people. So I really appreciate your comments. Thanks for that. It really helps make everything worthwhile. Next week, we'll be talking about times of crisis in periods of default. Okay. So today it's all about the business is continuing to run day to day but there are problems and how do you deal with them? Next week, we'll talk about situations as was seen with say Lehman Brothers. So let's just get to it. These are the non-default scenarios that we're gonna be talking about. One is collateral problems, then we'll be moving on to trading issues, then payment and corporate actions. I remember this is just for informational and inf entertainment purposes only. Uh, you always need to seek professional advice when you do anything involved in the investment space, including security. So this is part 12. As I said, we've been getting quite a lot of very positive feedback. I get a lot of very nice messages directly. And also uh, people have been putting comments in there. If you are interested in supporting us so that we get seen by more people and help spread the word about securities lending, then please uh, give us a thumbs up. If you want to get the next videos and subsequent videos, uh, subscribe and ring that bell so that you'll be notified when they happen. Okay. The kinds of problems that we can run into, we're talking about three different areas over this three-part series. One will be transactional, the other will be a default risk as I talked about. And then the third week, we'll be talking about what happens when a market starts imposing restrictions and we'll look at what happens in each of those situations. But as I said, we're going to be talking about the transactional related issues and those are the topics we'll be covering. Okay. So if we first focus on collateral, then I guess 
the obvious place to start is what kind of problems can occur? And primarily, what you have to remember is collateral is held as a risk mitigant in the event of a counterparty default. And the only way that can be an effective risk mitigant, of course, is if we always have sufficient collateral. And so the key function here is that you always want to make certain if you are a lender that your collateral exceeds the value of the securities you have on loan. Because if the counterparty defaults, you're going to take that collateral, you're going to sell it, and you're going to be trying to buy the securities that you had loaned out. But look, this is also an issue for borrowers, because what you have to remember is that when a lender lends, they're taking excess collateral. So they're lending out 100, and they might be taking a collateral value of 105. But if you're the borrower, it's the opposite. If you're the borrower, you're only getting 100, and you're giving out 105. So that's potentially an issue, and that's an ongoing real risk that they have to set capital aside for. So the lender always wants to make certain that they are sufficiently over collateralized and a borrower always wants to make certain that they're not more collateralized. They're not over collateralized beyond the level that they have agreed to. So both sides have an interest in this and the collateral can be calculated at either the individual transaction level or loan by loan or cumulatively across the portfolio. And you need to be satisfied in both situations there. Now, if there's a problem, what do you, do? if you are a lender, uh, you would of course require additional collateral. So the value I'm expecting to hold 105 of collateral, but because of the market movements or foreign exchange rates, the value of what I'm holding has dropped below that 105 level. So I now need the borrower to give me a top up. There's also the issue of maybe a stock that I got as collateral yesterday, maybe that got delisted and it no longer has a value. So today I don't even want to be holding that. So the borrower again has to substitute that. And the key thing here is that collateral exchange, whether it's releasing excess collateral back to the borrower or requesting new collateral from the borrower, that has to happen on a same day basis. Okay, and so this is how you maintain a secure position day in and day out. And this is a, a huge uh, factor in the low risk nature of the business because you are required on either side of the transaction to make certain that collateral sufficiency remains. Now, what happens if that doesn't happen? What happens if the excess collateral doesn't come or what if the collateral that no longer has value or you no longer want to accept collateral from a particular issuer, what happens then? Let me just stop there and say, what do you mean you don't want to accept collateral from a specific issuer? If you take a look at what happened maybe 2011, 2012, where there was a real European uh, sovereign bond crisis or at least concern, countries like Greece, where the bond ratings dropped, where the valuations dropped, where people just didn't want to actually be holding that collateral. Maybe I used to accept Greek bonds. Now, probably not, but I might've taken Spanish bonds or Italian bonds. And around that same period, those bonds came under pressure as well. So there was a problem there and you might take uh, Italian bonds today, but I won't take them tomorrow. And so you might have a whole asset class of collateral that you used to accept that you might be holding this morning that you no longer want to accept. So you can update your collateral schedule and just say, I need that to be replaced. Now, if the borrower is unable or unwilling to do that, then there's always the to cancel the loan, do a, a recall, ask for your loan securities back. And again, they have a contractual obligation to either collateralize it or return those securities, okay? But let's say that doesn't happen. The truth is your uh, fallback position is you put them into a mini default situation. So you aren't talking about the whole relationship being in default. You would look at it on a transaction by transaction basis, say this transaction is in default, you failed to remedy it or fix it. And so my only choice is to sell the collateral that I have 
that allows me to buy back the securities that you have failed or refused to return. So you can have a mini default situation. So the rest of the relationship can carry on, but that individual transaction can be remedied. Now, look, this is really super extreme. You don't want to do that because that's a problem for everyone. So realistically, <clears throat> it exposes you to uh, transactional risk because you have to sell the collateral, you have to buy back assets, and that's extra work that you don't need it also definitely damages the relationship and it's a problem so this doesn't happen very often and that's because these problems get fixed so you don't need to actually resolve it now, ultimately though this point here says you have to review the relationship and that relationship is say as i've said before no one loan is going to make anyone rich no one borrow and short is going to make anyone rich. That's actually not true. It can happen. <laughs> but in terms of borrower and lender relationships, it's all about cumulative transactions done over a period of time that make money in that part of the relationship. And so people really do their best to resolve problems uh, before they arrive. Okay. And that's your ultimate sanction. If you don't fix the problems, then we don't need to be dealing with you. And, and there's actually, it's not just about operations and it's not just about risk. There are regulatory requirements for many lenders that say that they must be over collateralized or collateralized to a minimum level. And if there's a shortfall, then that might give them a regulatory problem. So this is super serious. We're not just playing around. Now I do just want to make a point here about cash collateral, this final bullet point on the slide. If you go back to what I was talking about in the collateral segment in the videos, in a previous session in the fundamental series. What I've said is when a borrower gives a lender or its agent cash, and that cash goes into the money markets as an investment, whether that in money market investment outperforms or underperforms, that's not a concern of the borrower. So if an investor receives $105 of cash, and then they buy investments with that $105 of cash. And there's a problem with the investments and they drop to 103 or 102 or below 100. That's not a problem for the borrower because the borrower says, no, I gave you 105 and I've maintained that 105 on that daily rebalancing calculation. If you've taken that 105 and turned it into 103, that's your problem, not my problem. So you just need to be aware of that nuance. So collateral, a daily process, always reconciling positions to make certain that you're neither under collateralized nor over collateralized, well, or over collateralized too much. Typically, there is a little bit of over collateralization. So if the requirement is 105% of the loan value, borrowers might just leave a little bit more than that in order to cover off any sort of intraday fluctuations or just for ease of ease of calculation, frankly, sometimes. So what they can never do though, is say it's 104.9. I know it's 105, but that doesn't happen. That can't be allowed to happen. So it's 105 or more or 110 or more or 102 or more or whatever the arrangement is bilaterally between the lender and the board. Okay. So that's collateral. I want to say hello to, to JP. Thanks for joining us again. Always a pleasure to see you here. And, and I always enjoy connecting up with you every week. So appreciate your ongoing support. Thanks for joining me. Okay. So that was collateral. Now we're going to move on to what happens with trade fails. Okay. So this is a, this is where a new loan doesn't settle or a recall or a return doesn't settle. And what we're going to look at, is it different for a lender or a borrower? Now, the important thing to remember is that this is always a problem for some, okay? You can't just say, oh, you know, who cares? And depending on which side of the equation that you're on, it can have very important impacts. So if you just excuse me for a second, I'm just going to take a quick drink. As usual, it's the standard un, un advertising sponsored Coke drink, but that's where I live. There we go. That's a little bit better. Now, so let's look at that. What happens if a lender agrees to lend a security to a borrower, but doesn't deliver it on time? That's a problem because you remember that the reason most likely that a borrower has borrowed that security is that there's a short sale and they need those securities to satisfy the delivery 
of that short sale into the market. That means that there's a buyer somewhere that's expecting to receive those securities, or it's going through a clearing center where the borrower has an obligation to provide those securities. All right. And so that's a real, and in some markets where there is automatic buy-ins after a certain period, it might actually have financial implications because the lender has failed to deliver it to the borrower who has a delivery obligation into the market. They may get penalized. There may be charges there. So this is actually a really big deal. Now, why can that happen? Sometimes just human error, people make a mistake. Sometimes an agent will have said, yes, I'm happy to do this loan. I'll deliver you the thousand shares of, of Apple and the client that they were allocating the shares from had sold it in between when they made the loan and when the delivery of that loan was supposed to happen. And that really does happen. It doesn't happen in Apple shares though. Okay. Because there's plenty of Apple shares, but if it's a less liquid uh, stock, if there are fewer lenders of it, if there's a lot of borrowing activity in that, if there's a lot of trading activity surrounding a security that can happen. And so that's a, okay. As I said here, it's a bigger problem for the borrower because they have an onward obligation for a lender. The, the reality is the biggest problem for them is they don't start earning their fees right away. Like bigger problems have happened. And so my point here is that just because you're a lender and say a trade has failed, don't think it, that it doesn't have consequences. It's a very important issue that might have downstream consequences, not just for the counterparty, but also for market stability, because if you have loaned a security to a short seller who has sold it to someone else, who then has sold it to someone else beyond that, you're the roadblock. You're the one that's actually causing fails downstream. So take your responsibility seriously. The flip side can happen as well. A lender who has in good faith loaned out securities and it's been outstanding and everything has been fine all the way throughout. It may also be that when you ask for it back, which the borrower has a legal and contractual obligation to deliver those securities back to you, the borrower doesn't. Now, the truth is I've been around long enough where I've seen it happen as an error. Oh, we made a mistake. We input a hundred shares instead of a thousand shares. And so it didn't match up and couldn't settle. I've also seen instances where I've called the borrower and asked for my securities back and they have literally laughed and said, that's too hard. I'm not going to be able to get that one. And it's, you don't have a choice. You are legally and contractually obligated. And it's that kind of a scenario where typically borrowers do everything that they can to get the securities back in time. And what they'll, they'll do is they'll exhaust all of their other lending relationships. As I've said, legally, what they're required to do, if they can't return it on time, they have to, and they can't borrow it somewhere else. They have to buy it in the market. But at times, again, particularly in markets like corporate bonds, where there's less general market liquidity, that can be a problem. And in fact, in my own personal experience, that's where the problems usually have arisen is in markets like corporate bonds, because the liquidity and the ability to buy it in the market is not always there. Now, fortunately, that also acts as a regulator when putting the short sale on in the first place, because a short seller of a corporate bond needs to make certain that there's someone interested in buying it. And conversely, that there'll be someone willing to sell it at the end. So that acts as a regulator, which is why corporate bonds have never really been a, a huge part of the market in terms of overall percentage wise, although from a return point of view, they can be quite lucrative. Now, what can you do to minimize the likelihood of these problems? Number one, you can pre-match. So what do I mean by pre-match in the example where I gave, where someone inputted as a thousand shares of Apple and someone else put in a hundred shares of Apple. If on trade date or trade date plus one, they're matching their outstanding trades and they're saying, this is what I have with you. And you give me what I, what you have with me, or we're using an automated reconciliation service like Equilend or Pyram. <clears throat> the reality is you can spot a problem ahead of time and you can say, ah, oh, one of us is wrong. What's it supposed to be? And you can solve it. So that kind of settlement related issue uh, disappears. And that's what I'm talking about with these automated reconciliations. And through that, you, even if you're not doing automated reconciliations, you still need to identify and resolve the issue. Remember what I said? You can't just ignore it and hope it goes away. You have to solve for it. So you need to have 
a good focus on solving those problems. And then also just a, a top tip, you need to see whether the problem that you've identified is a one-off. So trader error, they put in a hundred instead of a thousand or whether it's a fundamental issue, it might be a problem with the static data. You might have the counterparty's account date information set up incorrectly. The reason it's important to understand what that root cause is because you want to fix it so that if you do another trade in the same scenario tomorrow, you won't have a problem again tomorrow. So this is about solving problems. Now look, sometimes the problem can't be fixed. So in the example where I said, where the lender in good faith made a loan, in the meantime, their client has sold it. There's no substitute. The reality is you need to cancel that trade and start again. So that borrower that needs to borrow those shares has to urgently find a replacement. And so that may lead to cancellation of, you might also want to adjust the fee levels because frankly, someone's carrying an exposure. And if the borrower is trying to return shares to a lender and the lender has the account details wrong. And so the trade doesn't settle or there's an error in the, the transaction details, the borrower is going to say, I'm not interested in paying you any fees on something where the problem is. And again, conversely, if there's cash collateral, again, if you recall, what I said is the lender who's investing that cash will give the borrower a rebate of some of that cash. Some of the investment returns they make from investing that cash, some of that goes back to the borrower. If there's a trade fail though, and that, that borrower hasn't returned the shares on time, the lender might say, I'm not giving you any rebate and thereby making it more expensive and making or providing an extra incentive to the borrower to return it. And then fundamentally, the last point there is make a claim if appropriate. Uh, if there are consequences of a failure to deliver, then the reality is you always have or often have the right to make a claim on the counterparty for them not living up to their part of the bargain. Okay. Again, so that's a, that's more commonly used in bond markets rather than equity markets and more commonly used when interest rates are higher when, than where they've been for the last decade. And it's really this kind of fail trade issue that is leading the regulators in Europe to implement the next phase of CSDR, which I talked about in the last, the last video on regulations part two, then what you actually have is the regulators have said, look, particularly for bond markets and where there's no dedicated buy-in regime because they trade over the counter, we are going to force the clearing centers to uh, initiate buy-ins. And it's really this kind of incentive to force people to make good on their delivery obligations that's driving that regulation. Now, again, what I discussed then, whether that happens or not, whether it's adjusted because of the potential impact, time will, but it's certainly, that's the reason for the proposed regulation as it is. And again, ultimately, if you have too many fails, or maybe even if you have one important fail, you might want to review the relationship. So in that example, where I said my counterparty laughed at me, Quite frankly, I escalated it. In fact, it was escalated to me because their counterparties, my team's counterparties at that same firm laughed at them. They laughed at me and we stopped dealing with that firm for two years uh, until they could confirm to us that they were taking a different attitude. And frankly, that only happened when the management changed. So until then, we uh, refused to lend them corporate bonds. Okay. Let's just go to the next one. So the next one is about late payments. Again, just a, a quick reminder that if you want to watch the YouTube channel where these recordings are or any of the other fundamentals series, just take a look at the caption below. <clears throat> that will tell you what our, our YouTube channel is. And I always appreciate if you give us a thumbs up or a like uh, on whichever platform that you're on. Okay. So thanks for that. Let's get back to the third of the four. These are just straightforward late payments and those late payments from a borrower to a lender relate to dividends, interest payments, or fees. As, as I say, really, this is just about a claim is due. A claim might even be agreed, but it just gets paid late and time is money. If I'm expecting money today from you and you don't pay it to me, you've got the benefit of the use of that cash. And I don't, and maybe I have other obligations. So what can you do about that? 
as I say here, really, you want to position yourself for success. So here again, we're talking about uh, the prepayment process. So I just have kind of an example of a timeline here for a dividend where a company declares the dividend with all the information. Then you have a process where you'd identify where you have loans outstanding. You'd reconcile with your counterparties as to the fact that you, I think I have a thousand shares. Do you agree? If the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, then why do we disagree? You need to research that. If the answer is yes, there is still another element you need to check because if I'm a lender, I might have clients from two, three, four, five different legal jurisdictions. They might all have different withholding tax arrangements for dividend. And when I loan that security to a borrower, I would have also told them what my net dividend requirement is. So in a typical example, an investor with a double taxation treaty between two countries, the, the, their country of investment and the country of where the security payment happens, if they're entitled to uh, withholding tax relief, then they would get that net payment. And so I might lend it from someone who is entitled to 85% of the dividend. So they suffer 15% withholding tax. My counterparty might've set that up correctly. But then in the meantime, over day-to-day -day activity, my original client have sold it. And I said, well, don't worry, I don't need to close the loan. I've reallocated it to another client. But what if that other client is in a different tax jurisdiction and they're only entitled to 75% of the dividend, or they might be a sovereign wealth fund that's entitled to 100% of the dividend. Unless my counterparty has agreed that correction or that amendment, then come dividend day, we might have different amounts. I might have claimed a different amount than they're interested in paying me. And so the payment might not happen. So identifying and reconciling positions ahead of time, hopefully through an automated process or through any kind of manual process, but that's, you've agreed. So you know that on the record date, so on the date when that entitlement accrues, the lender can raise a claim, a borrower might receive that claim, that you've agreed the position, you've agreed the withholding tax rate, so that on pay date, the claims should actually be, okay? So that's what I mean about setting yourself up for success. But the same thing happens with fees. Fees get reconciled at the end of the month, and these are almost always, but not always, automated. You owe me this much. I owe you that much. Those sorts of calculations and comparisons are reconciled. And if you're matching your figures day to day, if I match all of my trades outstanding every day on, an, on a uh, daily basis uh, across the size, the position, the fee rate, everything, then by the end of the month, my fees should be correct. It shouldn't be a big problem. And the reconciliation at the end of the month should be quick. If they're not, you have to resolve them. And usually uh, there is a fixed period by which the borrower is required to settle. And in some cases, they may settle and they might settle late because you haven't agreed. So what happens if I think you owe me $90 uh, and you think you owe me $80? There's different ways to reconcile. You can try to solve the problem, find out where that discrepancy is. And let's say you can't find it. Then what we might agree to do is we say, look, you, we both agree you owe me at least $80. So pay me that. And then we'll continue to negotiate on the other 10. Okay. And yeah, hopefully come to a resolution. So there's different ways practically that you can resolve these issues, but look, ultimately what some of the agent lenders will provide to their clients is support payments. They will fund the payments on the due date and then work it out with a borrower and maybe make a claim or just carry the funding cost. Now, sometimes that funding cost is invisible, but that's a video for, for its own. Uh, so we won't go into that, but again, be aware that some service providers will advance these funds, which will be a time value of money advantage to, uh, to their clients versus an agent that won't do that. But look, ultimately you want to review the relationship. If your counterparty, if the day-to-day -day activity is great, but they're always paying you fees late, so you might want to review those, those relationships as well. Okay. Late payments is all about money. Okay. Just a, a quick reminder, if you're interested in getting these slides and the slides from the previous events, you can actually go to that link there, sign up, 
and then we'll subsequently send you the full pack of all of the slides. So just have a look at that. I'll just make that disappear so that it doesn't uh, interrupt with the slide. Okay, this is the big issue. I'll come back to that after I've had a, another drink. Hold on. Right. Saturday and my voice is giving out. Right. Corporate actions. This is the biggest potential risk of loss. I've seen more money get lost through bad corporate action events than anything else. So what kind of problems can happen? First of all, the entitlement, let me take a step back. Remember that a lender going into a lending program basically wants to stay in exactly the same position as if they hadn't loaned out any securities. And they do that because the borrower agrees to take on any equivalency risks, right? They, they agree to make that lender whole for anything that happens related to those securities while they're on loan. So if there's a dividend payment or if it's a bond and interest payment, they agree that they'll make that lender whole. And so that's very positive. But they also agree related to corporate actions. Now, the only kind of ownership entitlement that a borrower can't make a lender whole for is the vote. So if you, we've talked about this in previous videos, if I'm an investor and I want to vote my shares, then I need to get them back if they're on loan or not lend them in the first place so that I can vote that. But everything else, that borrower has to make me economically whole. Now, corporate actions is two kinds. There are mandatory ones. So last year, Tesla had a stock split where one share on day one ended up turning into more shares after the stock split and they're equivalent. Okay. So if a borrower has borrowed one share and all of a sudden that one share has a stock split and it's now worth five shares, when that loan closes up, when there's a dividend announced, then it's on the new number of shares, not the old number of shares. So those things are mandatory. They just happen. The people don't have an option to opt in or not. That's what happens. But something like a rights issue where a company gives one of its existing investors the right to buy more shares, usually at a discount, that's an optional one because the investor isn't required to do that. They have the right to do that. It's an optional one. And so the flow here might be, I'm an investor, or I have a client who's an investor, they want to, there's a rights issue announced, they want to take up those rights. Now, normally, if I'm their custodian, I would just say, okay, I'll take up those rights on your behalf, I'll debit your account for the cash that I need to pay to get those rights, and everything will be fine. Now, all of a sudden, those shares aren't in the custody account anymore, they're on loan. So I have to now go to the borrower and say, my client wants to take up the rights issue. I'll give you the money for it, debit their account, but you have to get it to me. So that's an extra step in the process. That's extra timing and the borrower would just go out and buy it. But that's another link in the chain. Whenever there's another link in the chain, there's potential for problems or there's potential for delays. So that's an example of an optional corporate action where something might happen. Now there's also shockingly backdated ones that you can't do anything about. A company might make an announcement that says, oh yeah, shareholders that were on record six months ago are now entitled to this other benefit. Look, the truth is the loan that was made on a uh, best efforts basis, loan was made, the contractual obligations were there. If the company subsequently changes the terms, like a backdated event, that isn't really going to be something the borrower is going to be very happy about because I'm saying you wanted to take all these fees up front and now you're trying to also collect things from the past, which neither of us knew about, that's just not on. So those things uh, are always controversial. There are also short dated entitlements. So for example, uh, this has been a question in previous shows, a questions about rapids. So rapids are part of a structure in Australia where there's an accelerated capital raising by a company. So they might uh, short cut or short circuit the process and they'll say, look, we're trying to raise money. We're just going to go directly to our institutional investors. You have to decide today. And, and they, as it says, accelerate the process. And in a couple of days, they might actually have new capital in the firm to invest. And that's great. 
except it bypasses all of the normal processes in order to protect those shareholder entitlements. And so if shares are on loan and they're not in custody, that can cause. And so how can you deal with any of these issues? Well, number one, I'll go back again to say automated reconciliation is at the heart of all of this. Uh, typically people want to have multiple data sources so that if your main data source fails to tell you about a corporate action, that's okay. Cause you've got another one or another one that may be providing you with usually redundant information, but in case one carries it and the other doesn't, you have a fail safe mechanism. The other point, which I uh, make as a last point here, this keep at least one share in custody. One of the things that is a challenge about securities lending is it's different if there's actually shares in a custody account, or if there's just theoretical shares that are kept on a ledger and the real shares have been lent to the borrower and the borrower has sold them into the market and they're held by someone downstream. So typically what you'll find is most lenders will keep at least one share in custody so that they not only have the book entry positions with all of their multiple data sources, the custodian in the local market is still custodian of at least a share and they'll advise the lender that way. So it's just another way of getting more information with something like the rapids, which I talked about, or, and there's a couple of different flavors in Australia we put in place in my last firm is special procedures, which handle these sorts of things, which say, look, we know this is a feature of the market. If you want to borrow from us in this market, you need to agree to these special procedures, which protect our client. And some borrowers do that. And some borrowers won't do that. There is no risk elimination in business. It's a transfer of risk. And in that case, what we were doing was transferring the risk from our clients to the borrower and the borrower had to determine whether they were willing to take that economic risk in return for the benefit of being able to borrow those shares. But look, the impact, the bottom line here is that corporate actions can be more expensive than just about any other factor in the market in a non-default situation. So always bear in mind that corporate actions are an important area for investment and focus. So that's corporate action and that's it. So look, if all of these areas, there's many layers as always, in this case, I would recommend that if you want to learn more about any of these sorts of issues that you look at the paid for course, which, uh, which you can get on our, our courses there. Also the free one gives you uh, basically a little bit less than an hour of an overview of securities lending at sort of 50,000, the online course goes into a lot more depth than I can in a show like this, or that you'd be interested in watching in a show like this. So there's eight lessons plus an exam and you get continuing professional development uh, credits for that. And it's online on demand. So you can watch it at your leisure. And there's also the option there for one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you think that would be helpful to you in terms of asking questions. So it's great to learn things online, but what happens if you have questions? Of course, you can always come to events like this on our live streams and look for or raise questions there. And I'll do that. You can always email me directly, happy to do that. But if you want to have a consistent structured learning program, that's a, a great way to do it. So let's just summarize what we talked about today. These are uh, questions about what can go wrong with transactional issues. So with collateral adjustments are done on a same day basis, your uh, fail safe position there is if your counterparty doesn't deliver and you don't think that they will in future, then you always have the remedy of a mini default, but that's an extreme process, but you know, it's available to you contractually. On the second one, if there's a trade or fail or a recall, the truth is you need to be proactive. You need to automate pre-match and then solve problems if those problems arise, because whether you're a lender lending out securities or, and the, and your supply side fails, there's an impact for the borrower. Or if you're a borrower and you go, I can't really be bothered to get the shares or bonds back, understand that it has an an impact on that lender because that lender has recalled the shares for a reason. Maybe they wanted to vote. Maybe they've sold it themselves and now they have an obligation to deliver the shares in the market themselves and may be penalized. There may be buy-ins. There certainly will be reputational damage. So always take into account your counterparty and where they're coming from and why they're asking for what they're asking for. The third part was dividends and interest payments or fee payments on a monthly basis. Again, try to automate the reconciliation process, make payments on time, 
And if those payments haven't been made on time, make claims as appropriate. And then the final point was corporate action equalization. What you want to do there is have great data, multiple sources of it. You want to automate where you can. You want to resolve problems ahead of time before obligations become due. You want to have special procedures to handle special situations that actually arise. But this is an area that needs focus and attention. Otherwise it's very expensive. And fundamentally you always have the right to review the relationship, right? This is a business where it only works for both parties if it works for both parties. And if your counterparty isn't willing to, uh, to cooperate with that, then that's a problem. Hold on. That's not what I meant to do. Oh, I see what happened there. There we go. I was just trying to actually minimize the, my picture there. What I can do is just, what's that? How's that? There we go. So look, only deal with people, A, that you're comfortable with from a credit point of view, but B, that can support the operational processes, the day-to-day -day functioning of the business. This is where most of your activity is where the expense is, right? This is where the frustrations are. Uh, this is where the financing costs are. People don't go out of business that often. It happens, but it doesn't happen that often. And if you're selective about who you deal with, maybe it will never happen. And that's a good thing, but that doesn't mean that there won't be day-to-day -day problems. And again, you need to stay on top of that and deal with efficient people. Okay. That's your ultimate there. And that's it for this week. Uh, a little bit over the 45 minute mark, uh, securities lending in a time of crisis. We are going to talk about defaults next week. So I'm pretty certain that the word Lehman will come up and we'll examine what happened then and what the issues were in week 13. That will be a quarter of a year that we will be doing it. So I look forward to you joining me then either live or on replay. Remember, you can always uh, send me questions ahead of time if you want me to address them on the show. That's my email address. Don't forget to subscribe and, and I appreciate you joining me this Saturday and hope to see you next Saturday and in future. Thanks and goodbye. Have a great weekend.